Okay, welcome back everybody to Statistical Inference. We're gonna go through a number of topics today. We'll see what we get through, as always. Um, this, this class is really just a running conversation. And so, conversations are better if you guys are engaged in them. Uh, but we'll warm up and get up to everything, get to know each other a little bit better, figure out we can ask questions, things like that. Uh, did everybody get my email that I sent out? with all of your resources and things like that. So um, Slack, you'll want to sign up for that. A lot of communication goes over that. If you're having trouble logging into Slack and getting on that page, make sure you're signed into Gmail for your VT account and register through that. It's instantaneous. So um, otherwise you're going to struggle. So I've seen people with that. So if you can't sign up for Slack, um, some of the technological hurdles in this class are going to be difficult for you. So you'll want to do that first. Anybody have any difficulty? Okay. Every once in a while I hear that some people don't know how to use their web browser. Well, when I do it, it's assigned in your workspace. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. Do we have like a workspace Slack URL? Because I am logged into my computer. Let's look at it afterwards. Okay. And make sure that you can get on. I had somebody come to me halfway through the semester and said, I just haven't been able to get on. So we'll figure it out. Uh, okay, a few logistics. Uh, first thing is you guys know where the YouTube page is. So I see that a lot of you have signed on to that. These are all public. So I don't block anything. I think that the lecture is the least of the things we can give out for free around here. So it's not that big of a deal. If you're teaching, this actually works out pretty well for everybody. I think I'll continue this even after the pandemic. Um, this is our class from last time. And if you want to check out classes from the last year or two to see where you're at or get a different version of things, here's us. <clears throat> you can look through uh, old lectures as well if you want a different variant of everything. There's you. So um, don't let this ruin your question asking time as well. I think a lot of people get a little bit nervous about asking a question and knowing that it's going to be recorded. That's all part of the process. You guys know that. And so I'm here to answer your questions. OK. Let's do a few logistics. Maybe we need a calendar just to look at this. Hopefully you guys have brought your calendar. So here's us right here. We need a couple midterm dates. And so does anybody know when spring break is going to be this year? Yeah, so right around here. Let's go here to March. So is it uh, this week? Yeah. yeah. So we can't do a midterm then. So first question, you want it before or you want it after? Before. Those are all befores. It's interesting. When I was in school, I always liked it after because I could spend my whole break studying. I think that's what people like to avoid. But I don't know. If you give me more practice time to get better, I'll always take it. So and enjoy it and you know do it on the beach or whatever. But if you guys want it before, that's totally fine. Um, it makes sense to me if we do do it before that we don't do it right here on Friday. So for obvious reasons. So I'm inclined to say right here. What do you guys think? Midterm one is going to be on March 2nd. This is going to be in class. So you know the drill. Where do I get the variation? Time. And so this is going to be very homework-esque if you can do the homework problems relatively quickly, which is a lot different than when you first do a homework problem. First time through a homework problem can take you all day. So if you're really digesting it, thinking through everything, reviewing peripheral materials, and then the second time you do that homework, it's in like 10 minutes. 
So hopefully you're going through the process. There's no secret in this class. This is the easiest class to do well in because all you have to do is work every single problem in the book. And that's a good pathway to get an A. Now, nobody's gonna do that, but you get the point. So the homework assignments that I give you are a bare minimum. And so you wanna be working as many problems as you can. There's lots of ways to formulate problems. Change the distribution. That's it. So that's what we do. Look at interesting problems, change the distribution. Make sure you can work it out. You know, some distributions are harder to work with than others. And so you'll be want to work, wanting to work with as many distributions as you can. You start to see the patterns. So I think that's the, the name of the game. And so midterm one will be designed to be easy to medium problems. You'll be working on your speed and just making sure you understand the general concepts. On the final, things will be a little bit different. So the in-class exam has a benefit that I can't ask you anything too perilous. Okay, midterm two. <clears throat> so I don't want to do it absolutely way too late, but I kind of like to use it as a little bit of prep for the final. And so pretty late, but not super late. Um, I think that we are on for a Saturday final in May. So we're way over here. That's our final date. I think that's what we want to look at. So I'm inclined to say something like that. Wednesday the 20th. Keep them on Wednesdays. Then you have time to ask some questions. If we can design the review session in an appropriate manner, maybe we can do it early in the week and then you always have a review before the midterm. What do you think? Wednesday the 20th? Is that right? So that's April 20th, it's a Wednesday. Make sure I've got the right calendar. It's very common for me to have 2021 pulled up, so watch that for me. I'll need lots of attentive eyes, it's nine o'clock in the morning. Okay, Wednesday the 20th. be aiming for an in-class again, we'll repeat that. Um, if need be, we'll pivot to uh, take them. And there can be added benefit there as well. It takes you a lot longer to do a take home because I make the questions a little bit harder and it turns it into a big study session. So it takes away all this study up front and marries it into the, the process. So if we do do take homes, we'll make sure we build enough time so you can think about them. Okay. Um, Final is set for us already. Just write these down myself. Thank you, you guys. The most easygoing group I've ever had. So usually this is the hardest activity. Okay, last one, I probably just jinxed us. Review session. So the name of the game in the review session is you're going to go to the Slack page and you're going to fill out questions. What I used to do before we had things like Slack or I just wasn't using it, is I'd ask you guys to write a queue of questions <coughs> on the board. And it turned out to be a little bit of a, a bad experience because you guys would have to get up in front of each other and write your question out. And so I think that that hindered some of the questions. So I have always preferred you guys not to ask me just homework questions. It's inevitable that you will. Um, but ask me more illuminating questions and we can have a discussion about those sort of things. So my hope is that we can do both. And so I wrote on the Slack page um, what an interesting question might be. I don't know if that question was actually interesting. I just made it up on the fly if I could explain something about the dimensionality of something. Um, when we get into sufficient statistics, that question might make some sense. And so we can always go through examples and conjure examples or look at examples that we've already studied, and that's what we're going to be doing throughout the class. I don't do a lot of just integration on the board, but if you want to go through the nuanced steps of integrals, review session is a really good time to do that. And so it takes a little bit longer. You guys are going to want to check my work. I'll probably make a mistake periodically, so we need the time to fix it up. Um, we can ask anything during a review session. It could even be a philosophy question, and I like that sort of stuff as well. Talk about the history, talk about why do we do things, 
Are there other possibilities? And in this class, there's a lot of possibilities for doing something. The tricky part about inference is there's no absolutely correct answer. What we want to be able to do is be close, and we want to define what close is. And so make sure we understand what the repercussions of our um, objective functions that we define are. Um, so review sessions, I think because we're doing midterms on Wednesdays, it makes sense that we could do maybe a Tuesday or something like that. What I do like to do before a midterm session is do a yes, no, maybe session as well, where I answer what's going to be on the exam. So I'll make three columns on the board. I'll try not to fill up maybe with everything and see if you guys can hone in on which questions I'm going to ask you. It's not supposed to be a secret. It's supposed to be pretty anticipatable. So we'll do that as well if we can do it maybe on a Tuesday. So does anybody have any strong opposition to Tuesday evening review sessions? Depends what time. Okay, what time is good for you? Before seven. Before seven. Okay, I like that time too because I like to go home and eat. So um, it can take about two hours. So do you mean before seven you're walking out the door at seven and it's good? Uh, I have a class from five to seven forty-five. Yeah, that makes sense. So what about Monday? Monday I'm good. What about you? So Monday's maybe better? I understand. Monday always just sounds frightening. I always hate Mondays, but it does work. What do you guys think? We have only classes on Monday. Say it again. We have only classes on Monday. It's fine. You guys tell me. So, somebody is going to get hosed here. So, it's guaranteed. So, if I had a class of seven, we could probably appease everybody. What do you think? Let me just ask for a poll. Um, who prefers Monday? Say about five o'clock. Hands up. Can we do mornings instead? Mornings? Oh, no. It just doesn't work for me. <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> like we start at 9 a.m. on Mondays, so I do do um, after class office hours. I try to hold about a half hour or so. So there's always lots of possibilities for asking questions. So probably not Monday morning. So Mondays, hands up. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'll consider a lot of indifference. It's Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a little, a little bit more. Um, if we did do Tuesdays, is there any huge problem with that? We've got one person with a class. So I don't have a problem if somebody comes in and records. I'm not going to do it myself because it's going to ruin the whole review session. I know this from experience. So I'm just going to watch the review, try to get the answers, do them real quickly, and you just get less out of it. So we've got two people that have problems. Do you have friends that could do a recording for you? Yes. <laughs> yes? <laughs> so if we have one person, maybe you can share it with our colleague. Is that possible? Let's try that. If there's some huge opposition, now what I'll do for the yes, no, maybe is I'll take a picture of the board and I'll post it to Slack. So if there are things that you're actually dying to know, one thing you can do is you could possibly write on Slack, I can't make it, I really want to know this, and possibly I can record that and put it online. Possibly your friends could do it, but for yes, no, maybe, if there's something where I need to take the picture of a board and put it up for you guys, I can do that. So yes, no, maybe, we'll make sure that you guys all know, and then there'll be ample opportunity for you guys to ask other questions. Thanks for the flexibility, you guys. If I need to be flexible to accommodate you, just let me know. So reviews. Tuesday. At, I'm going to say 515. That should work. 
So till about the seven, <coughs> something like that. My experience is they last an hour or two. So I'm not into that four hour marathon, but I have seen three hours before. So it's up to you guys how we conduct it. I can do a little bit of recording when it's absolutely necessary. So I'm happy to do that. So Tuesdays at 5.15. And these are going to be approximately bi-weekly. We're not going to do this every single week. So approximately bi-weekly. So they coincide with when assignments are due, things like that. So there will be two projects in this class where I'll ask you to code something up and do a simulation study and do comparisons. Um, those are always good questions. What are the technical details? How would I code something up? I'm not going to show you code per se for your homework assignments. That's for you to figure out. But I'll be sharing code with you throughout the assignment. And I'll tell you maybe, here's the simple way, but if you were an industrial statistician working at a company, you might not do something the way that you would do it in this class. Sometimes we just do things to prototype them, show proof of concept. OK, so I think we have all of our logistics. Anything we're missing? OK, just as a. Um, Another comment about grading. The homework grades, the way we grade in the midterms and the finals are very different. So I don't like to penalize you too harshly when you're training, when you're practicing on homeworks. So I do have a scheme that says minus one on a homework problem means you've got it, you understand everything, but you've made an error, some small error. And it's almost undetectable. Um, you maybe couldn't see it. It's not blatantly obvious. Minus two is going to mean something like you have a small error. It's easy to correct, but you have a conceptual misunderstanding. So for instance, maybe you give me an estimator for variance and it can be negative. And so then you haven't recognized that. And so there are conditional variance formulas. They do have minus signs, but you have to understand when things do go negative and when they're not. And so I always want you to inspect that and think about it. So a minus two is going to mean it's easy for you to fix the calculation, but you haven't stopped and thought about your answer, which I think statisticians should do. Everybody should do that. And minus three means you've completely missed the mark. So those scores are really close to each other. So you might get something like a 91 on a homework, and if you've incurred three minus threes to get there, you've got a big problem. And so on the midterm, those are going to look like minus a lot. Um, one other thing that we do is if you skip a problem altogether, I'll make it minus 10. And if you skip two problems, we won't grade it. And so if you're not willing to practice, we're not willing to assess is the idea. And so the homework is there for you to do minimal practices. Um, of course, we're reasonable about things. If you have some strong reason you need an please ask me up front. So it really bothers me when you guys ask the night before. I've got all this stuff done. I've got a conference I'm going to tomorrow. I've got blah, 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 blah. Can I please have an extension? I understand how life works. All of that stuff is anticipatable. And so it's not that it bothers me on a personal level. It makes me worry for you. And so I want you to be diligent throughout the class because that's going to make you successful. Um, so midterm homeworks, we grade easy, but those scores are supposed to indicate something to you. If you're getting minus two on everything all the time, that's not great. You're slowly bleeding out your score. And we'll want to catch that as well. I do make a note in my grade book is the way you lose points. And so if you do on a midterm lose everything on one easy problem, and it happens, you know, you give somebody the easy problem and they just whiff it. And it's like minus 20. Oh my goodness. Uh, I do make notes about that as well. And so if it is something like that at the end of the day, then I'll, I'll go back and think, God, oh, it was just this one mess up. It probably shouldn't impact your entire career. And so. Anyway, that's the idea. If you're ever worried about the assessment, you can come and talk to me. Um, I'll be sharing with you after we do major events like midterms approximately what the scores mean. Okay. Cool.
I want to start out and talk a little bit more about conditional weight dependence. So we're going to run through a sequence. I'm going to tell you what exchangeability is, sampling with and without replacement. This is all in those sections 5.1 to 5.3. So hopefully you've read through this. This class does sneak up on you. That the level of mathematics in like 5.1 is very different from what you see in the later parts of that chapter. And so don't lull yourself to sleep. Get the early part of the class out. This is super easy because by the middle of this, this is pretty hard. So always be on top of it. But we'll go through some of these very easy problems, relatively easy in terms of the algebra. And I think you understand what these things are. We're going to be jumping to the bootstrap real quickly. And in those sub chapters 5.1 through 5.3, they just mention the bootstrap that sampling with replacement is the basis for bootstrapping. And hopefully you've seen this, but I want to use this as a conceptual example for what sampling does. Bootstrapping used to be one of my least favorite techniques because it's just so unsophisticated. There's almost nothing to say about it other than it kind of works. And now it's one of my favorite techniques because it kind of works and it's a good illustration for what we do in statistics. And I think it sends very important messages. <clears throat> um, we'll talk a little bit about that, and I'll be giving you an assignment to compare that to two other techniques. Um, keep in mind that next Friday you're going to be turning in definitions on various branches of statistics. I think I said classical, frequentist, Bayesian, and fiducial. Fiducial comes up in our book for about this much, and so nobody does it anymore. And we'll say a little bit about what it actually is, and so and where the insights came from, um, and where the confusions arose. So, um, but I just want you to know that there's branches of statistics, and people have been coming up with lots of stuff. There's been competitors to probabilistic statistics as well. Does anybody know some of these competitors that you've seen in the past? Partial ordering systems. Fuzzy logic comes to mind. Chaos theory comes to mind. Those are all relics of the past now. So fuzzy logic, you can come up with some neat inferences and say, ah, you should use X bar to estimate the mean and the normal distribution. And even chaos systems, you can come up with those answers. But in high dimensions, they don't scale well. And they don't work. So everything we're going to be doing is at least probabilistic in nature. So I haven't seen anything that beats out the construct of probability. It's coherent, it scales well to high dimensions, so on and so forth. Um, we'll have to talk about the word coherent later on. So I want you to just take a stab at those. They don't need to be absolutely correct answers. I even enjoy some of the wrong answers. They make me chuckle. So, and I'll share a few of those with you. So the name of the game is that at the end of this class, you understand some of these differences and you can summarize them well. I've always been enamored by some of my friends that they've been doing stuff for like 20 years. And you ask them, so what do you do exactly? So what's Bayes? And they'll go on and on and on for four hours. You know, they'll start out at a party, people will be around them. There'll be one person hanging on. Like, oh my goodness. What is this answer? You should be able to say something in like two sentences. You know? And so I'd like you to be able to do that by the end of this class. If you don't know what all these things are, and they're just words to you, we'll discuss them and I'll give you my definitions later in this class. Okay, let's talk about um, conditional independence. This is the same thing that we were talking about before. Let me just ask, can anybody not see this? It looks pretty small. Maybe I should blow up my font a little bit. This is just a coin flipping exercise. So I'm just flipping a coin. I used to actually do this with a real coin and dice and have you guys come up here and roll my loaded dice. So we'll see what's going on and then we have a discussion. We can't do that in COVID season. So we're gonna just do this. So here's kind of a coin flipping um, exercise. It just takes in a number of flips and then it's running everything through a for loop. It's drawing from a binomial where n is 1, that's called a Bernoulli, and there's some probability of success. And I pause every once in a while so you can see what's going on, and I just print whether or not we've landed this head on, this coin on heads or tails, where heads coincide with probability p and tails coincide with probability 1 minus p. You guys should all be familiar with this. 
And so I want to just kind of look at this for a second. I have P inputted. I need to do this. I need to have a probability distribution defined. And in the inferential land, we don't get to see P. What we get to see is the realizations. And then we try to infer what P is. Let me just do something real quick. Let me just run this. Sometimes if I move my screen around, it does funny things with the projector on. So let's just do this. Here's my flip coin. I'm going to flip it 10 times and see if you can learn anything. And let me just ask the question before we do this. Um, are these realizations independent of each other? So are the realizations, the head, tail, what you get to see, or if you want to encode it as a one or a zero, I don't really care. Are they independent? So let's just ask that question and write down that you guys said, mm, yeah. So questions. Are the draws samples independent? I'll say they're identically distributed. It's always going to come from the same coin flipping mechanism. If I were actually flipping a coin with my hand, they're not actually identically distributed because my hand does something different every time. But it's so close that we take that as an approximation. So in statistical land or basically engineering or anything that we do, everything's a bit of a conceptualization or approximation to something. And so a lot of you guys say, yes, kind of, maybe. Anybody disagree with this? OK, let's have a look. So I'm going to flip my coin 10 times. My first draws, heads, 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 tails, heads, 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 is what we ended up getting. Anybody have any problems with that? So I think I saw heads a bunch of times, one tail, and then some more heads. Anybody surprised? Yeah. Um, if you assume that it's an evenly weighted point, it would be a little bit more tails. Yeah, maybe a little bit more tails. So you've learned something. Can we make the assumption it's a fair coin? Mm -hmm. Why would you? What is the probability of my coin? Hopefully 50%. You say hopefully, you're, yeah. you're a rather optimistic person. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a lot of trust. So my coin doesn't have to be anything like that. So because I just made it up, I didn't grab from my pocket. And even if I did, I'm a statistician, I might have some sort of a double-sided coin or something like that. And so you might argue symmetry maybe tells you a coin maybe should be 50-50, but they're not symmetric. So they might be close. It turns out that a typical quarter will land tails 52% of the time. So because they're weighted different on the two different sides. And a long run average would tell you that. Turns out for us, when we get into hypothesis testing, I'm going to say we really don't care and that 2% isn't a big deal to us and we need to be privy to that. But if we computed a p-value on whether or not it's high and flip the point a lot of times, your p-value is going to be astonishingly small. And so the question is, is, do you care? We'll come back around to that. I don't think we can assume this is a fair point. So let's flip it again a whole bunch of times. What do you think the probability of this coin is? Maybe 0.85, that's interesting. <laughs> that's a inter you, you have some sort of random air function that you're able to do here. With it. I think I would probably guess it's about 0.9 right here. Did anybody see what I input it in? Yeah. Wait, what was it? I got a point one in there, didn't I? So let's just flip this again. This kind of doesn't coincide with that. So maybe I didn't reverse my print statements, but I haven't. So let's just rerun it again. I'll do it more times. As a statistician, this is what I wish I could ask people to do. Just do it a whole bunch of times. You don't even need to know any math if I could just say increase in. Keep increasing in. <laughs> so, unfortunately, as a statistician, I get fired if that's what I told people all the time. Just increase that, make it a billion, and I'll tell you what your answer is. 
So let's just make it 20 times. We saw another tail in there. Two tails. <coughs> Three tails. Three tails out of 20. What do you think? P is 0.1? No way. So it's not. I changed this right before I ran it, and I changed it to a point nine. So my screen doesn't freeze up. So when I change the monitor, sometimes it does weird things like that. But I did it just to trick you. So I took away P, and that's the world that you live in. You don't get to see P. And you might have some false assumptions about it. And I tried to steer you into thinking it was point one. And so and I'll do the same thing with dice if I have my loaded dice. And you'll start to realize, after a bunch of realizations, if I have tricked you, you'll figure it out through the data. Please. Okay. So I would say the answer is no, it's not independent. However, it's conditionally independent. If you did know P, then the realizations are independent of each other and you don't learn anything about it. Knowing that random generating function is all you need to know. But in statistics, we don't get to know P. So the data itself is not independent. It's conditionally independent. We can factorize that conditional form, but we can't factorize the actual um, data itself. And that's true for any distribution. And so I'll revise and say the answer is it's not independent, but it's conditionally independent. And in math class, or maybe your early intro stats classes, this is what they meant to tell you, the conditional on this probability that it's independent. As soon as I say it like that, people assume that you're setting them up for some sort of conditional flip and you're treating P as part of a probability distribution itself. So probabilities on probabilities. And I would argue that is what you want to do, and that is what it is, but sometimes we'll hear some debates about this. But either way, it's only when you know P are the realizations independent. I.e., if you know P, the realizations so what I mean by realization is the XI's are independent. And I think this is a rather important thing to distinguish. The data itself is not independent, but it's conditionally independent given the sampling model. And so there's a big distinction right there. And so what we're doing with data is we're learning all these things about the distribution that we don't already know. Sometimes you're, you're learning like what the functional form of the distribution is. Sometimes you're just learning what the parameters are. In this class, I'm going to assume we know the functional form, the parametric family. But later on in your life, you probably don't even know that. So, you know, you're going to come up with assumptions and test them. Sam? So the concept of independence doesn't really exist because we're always conditioning on the work. I would say for data, it does not exist. If I were in a math class and I was talking about sets, and I told you how everything was formed, then yeah, it exists. So, but for data, data is not independent. So in any case. So when we say IID, what we mean is it's independent and identically distributed, meaning you know all the, the stuff in the model to produce everything. So, and that's what I need to do to code it up on my computer is I need to say what the model was. So, but when you take away knowledge of the distribution, all of this data is telling you something. And so if I ended up seeing heads, 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 and then a block of tails, and then a block of heads again, I would think, oh, it's not even identically distributed. It's changing the distribution through the sequence, and I would want to look at that. So the data is always telling you something. So keep in mind, the notion of independence is data with model. And so it's not a data on its own concept. And I'm going to show you a data on its own concept in a second. And so and that's called exchangeability. And the idea is 
is that the order of these realizations does not matter. And so let me just say a fact. Let me give you a definition first. And then I'll tell you something about it. In the relationship between conditional independence, so when I say independence, I always mean conditional on something. So definition. This doesn't show up in the book, and I just wanted to make this revision. Let's talk about data. We're statisticians, so let's come up with concepts that apply to data. So definition, exchangeability. And I'll just say um, the order of the data doesn't matter. So what it really means is this is true. f of x1 and x2. I can do this for an infinite sequence or some finite collection of data and make this an n. I'm just going to do it for three data points. Let's do three. If you want to butter this up and make this more formal for any arbitrary number of data points, you can come up with an induction proof and use a double indexing scheme or something like that. And I'm just going to obviate that. This is going to be the same as x2, x1, x3, which is going to be the same as f of x3, x2, x1. There's other ones, so on and so forth. So three factorial different permutations of this. So there's six of them, and you can write them all down. So it means that the marginal distribution of the data has the same probability. And that's what it is to be exchangeable. I think that makes sense. So if things are conditionally independent, they're exchangeable. So there's a connection. If data is IID, and I'll say this does imply conditionally independent. So conditioning on the P, i.e. I have an identical distribution of something, then things are exchangeable. And so when I see this, I mean conditional independent. So the data itself is not independent, but maybe with model in hand, and you know the parameterization of that model, you know the actual values, and you can factorize. Then it's exchangeable. <coughs> so proof. Now keep in mind, you, you get to know this, you get to know the form of fxi given p. So that's your distribution that you're playing around with. You get to know it. So in our case, it's just a Bernoulli distribution. So for our example, in our case, it would just be p to the xi 1 minus p to the 1 minus xi. That's a Bernoulli distribution. I'm assuming my xi's are ones and zeros, and one is associated with p. So if I plugged in a one right here, this would be p. If I plugged in a one right here, this would be zero. So that would vanish, this would be p. Vice versa, if I make that a zero, that's going to become a one here, and this will be 1 minus p. So it's telling us those probabilities. So that's what this is right here. In general, you get to know it. So, or you need to be able to figure out something that's approximately right for your data in a real context. So my assumption in this class is we get to know what these are. So here's our thing right here. So if I have half of x1 and x2, 
unconditional on the P, how do I get this? There's only one way to do this. So to get rid of P, I've got to do something to it. So how do you get rid of things from probability distributions? Integration. Integration. So I marginalize out. I average out. So I need to integrate that thing away. And I don't really know what P is. I need some sort of model to tell me what P is. Now, this might appear that I'm being a baby, in, but I'm really not. I'm just talking about my uncertainty in P and what I think P might be. And I'm modeling that. What I want to kind of point out to you, this is my averaging. So function for generating P. And we don't know exactly how I did that in the first place. So I came up with P somehow. Somehow I picked point 0.9 and I picked point 0.1 and I came up with it. Sometimes in nature, these might exist. There might be some random process saying how you pick P in general. Um, and sometimes you might build this function in for weighting purposes. And we'll talk about it later. So if I wanted to weight different solutions. I want to point out that this is only factorizable. And you can try this for any distribution you know. Try it for a normal distribution, try it for a Bernoulli distribution, anything. That if this is not a point mass right here, this will not factorize. So if I have some sort of an averaging over multiple values of P, it's going to tangle up all those X's. You can try that for any distribution you want. But this will not factorize right here. However, this does factorize. So this is f of x1 given p, f of x2 given p. Right here. Where do I get that from? It's iid. So it factorizes. And, oh, and I, I guess I can do my x3 in here too. We said we've got three down. So I'll just write in the third one. And I learned a long time ago that I can shuffle these around. I can commute everything. So, and I can go back to my second grade teacher and try to come up with a reason for that. I was a math major, so you've got astonishingly like correct ways to prove these things. We're not going to do that in this class. We know the property of multiplication. We can shuffle this. And so I can come up with any order that I want. And so I'll just write this out is this might be integral of fx3 given p, fx2 given p, fx1 given p. It doesn't matter which order I see this in. This thing is going to be fx3, x2, x1 given p. I'll integrate with respect to whatever my generating function for P is. I could do this in my simulation where I could have had a random generator for P and you never get to see it. You don't get to actually see P and I don't even know what it is. And I probably should have done that, but we'll make it easier. Just so everybody knows we're integrating between zero and one right here. So this is a definite integral there's no P in this equation because we've integrated it out. And this is going to be fx3, x2, x1. So that's exchangeability. Uh, on the homework, I just put in a, an extra little problem that's outside of the book. And it says, um, prove that if things, if you're going to sample without replacement, it's exchangeable, but it's not IID. IE, you change the probabilities every single time you reach into it. And I'll walk through with you next time and kind of go through this. What I want to just jump into is our last example. So we'll come back around to this next time. Talk a little bit about more about sampling with replacement and without replacement. I'll exclude that right now. You can read through it in your book and we'll just spend 10 minutes at the beginning of the next class going through it. So that's what exchangeability is. It's a data-driven concept. 
I don't actually need actual functions to plug in here to show that this is true. So this is going to be true for any arbitrary function. And that's what we've shown. So I would say the data-related concept is exchangeability. It, you know, has something to do with IIDness. But IIDness is something with model at hand. So just a prelude to things down the line, when we talk about things like sufficient statistics, it's not a data concept, it's a data with model concept. You need model at hand. You need to know where everything came from. And in the real world, we don't exactly know. So we'll talk about all those issues. Let's go back to our other example. So this is our mid-range example. <clears throat> and all I want to do is provoke some questions. So it's going to take us a while to answer these questions. So we have this distribution. Same distribution as last time. Xi's are going to come from a uniform distribution. Zero theta. Our parameter of interest is theta. In my code, I call this A. I goes from 1 to N. One of the constructs I'll use in this class is if I don't say it's IID, I mean it's IID. So unless I tell you the mechanism of dependence, it's IID. Now, if there becomes three times in this class where people go, do you mean IID? I'll start writing it in, if it really bothers you. If you'd like to write IID over the top, go ahead. But unless I tell you the mechanism of dependence, I mean IID. Good. Um, let me just ask you, what's the nature of this parameter? What type of parameter is it? Different parameters have different properties. So if you tell me, oh, I've got x's and I've got a theta and I want to estimate them, I'm going to have to ask you, well, what is the, the functional relationship between the x's and the theta? Somebody might say, oh, I don't know, just tell me what theta is. I can't. So you need to tell me what the nature of that parameter is, how it relates to the x's. So you have to tell me the model or we have to come up with some model and validate whether or not that model is good. So, what would you say this parameter is? What's its nature? Yeah. What's that? It's an upper bound? Yeah. Let me ask you this. Is it a location parameter? If you're familiar with that terminology. Does it shift the whole distribution around? It doesn't shift it, it stretches it. So what is something that stretches a distribution? It's a scale parameter. So this is a scale. That's important. We'll come back around to this later on. But scale distribution. If I had a uniform 0, 1 and I multiplied it by theta, it would be this. And that's what we call scaling a distribution. That's an important thing. It's also the boundary, which is kind of weird. Unlike a normal distribution, the scale doesn't define the boundary. And boundary conditions like this, when you're trying to infer something on the boundary, it really makes the problem a lot harder. And that's why I like to start out with something that's a little bit difficult. And so, if we go to this code right here, my mid-range example, I have a lot of different methods coded up for inferring theta. And I'll put this code on Slack, you can look at it over the weekend and we'll come back to it next time. But if I look at this, I call this range mid-range because I compute ranges in mid-range in here. And it's a problem that we come back into the book. So you'll see this later on in chapter five, this exact distribution. You might want to start looking at that distribution. So if I run this, and I've got five different types of estimators right here. I haven't run through this real carefully. I'll write it on the board next time. I've got the range. And all I'm doing for every time I sample from this, I compute a range from everything that I plot in. And then I have two times the mid-range. We'll talk about all these next time. I have two times x bar in all of this. So do you know what f, or two times the mean? The mean is theta over two. So two times the mean is going to be some estimate of theta. And then I have some other answers over here. Question is, is which answer is best? And how do you know? 
And could we develop an understanding of what is the best possible answer we could come up with? And I think the answer is almost, but we have to constrain the problem and say in a class of certain types of estimators, we can say what's best. But we can't just say what's best on its own. So what I want to point out is that there's two obvious things that, have, that are related to what's best. There's systematic biases, and then there's the stochasticity of your estimator. So all of our estimators are function of data. They're random. They're transformations of random variables. And so we need to control its systematic bias and its variability. And you can do one or the other. Maybe you can do both simultaneous, but there's going to be a functional form of those two things. And you always have to make this choice of which one you want to minimize. And so because that choice always exists, there is no answer to this question of what is best. What we can say is inside some functional form, I can come up with a best estimator of a particular type, and then maybe I can invoke some properties and say that estimator has particular properties. Let me just ask, which estimator do you think is best out of all of these? Well, who likes this one? So this one is two times x bar. So, the mean of the distribution is theta divided by 2. It's right in the middle of the uniform. And so my estimate of the middle might be x bar. And so 2 times x bar is approximately theta. And so, and I kind of like this, that 100 is right in the middle of all of this. Who likes this answer? Some people. It looks nice. Um, who does not like the answer? Sam, can you give us one reason instantaneously as to why you know this answer is beatable? It gives impossible uh, to the right, but it can't be above 100. Yeah, but we don't know, right? We don't know what the valid ranges of theta are. Right. So, but yeah, it does give values that aren't true. So, we'll come back to this question next time, but maybe somebody can come in and say instantaneously, why you can look at this and know it's not an optimal answer. It certainly estimates what we want to, and it's an okay answer, but we can guess that it's not optimal. Do you guys know anything about sufficient statistics yet? So X bar is not a sufficient statistic for theta. And we're gonna be getting around to that in chapter six. So if you don't use what's sufficient, and you use something different, we can know your answer is beatable. We'll come back around to this next time. Thanks, you guys. If you have any questions, I'll stick around for a couple minutes.